Good afternoon and welcome to this ACT webinar on money market reform and the countdown to implementation. With the European Money Market Form in its final stages of implementation, we're going to discuss some of the issues that will impact corporate treasurers as they transition from constant net asset value funds. In particular, we're going to focus on euro-denominated funds and the reverse distribution mechanism. The key risks corporates should be thinking about when transitioning to these new funds the post-reform landscape, and last but not least, we'll touch on Brexit. I'm Michelle Price and I work in the policy and technical team here at the ACT. But before we get started, there are a few technical points about the webinar set up for those of you who have not joined us before. There is a menu bar across the bottom that allows you to open various windows, and you can move these around your screen, resize them, and minimize them as you wish. The yellow button with a question mark is for help if you, if you have any technical difficulties, and we hope you don't. The resource box is where you can download further information, and uh, within this you will find some Fitch research papers that have been put there. There's also the ACT calendar of events. Most importantly though, the purple question and A, Q and A, should I say widget, opens a new window and you can send questions to us by typing in this window. Please don't wait until the end to send in your questions. Just send them in as they occur, and we won't disclose any names. A recording of this webinar will be available on the ACT website in a couple of days, along with a separate copy of all the slides. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Alistair Sewell, who is the Head of Fund and Asset Manager Ratings for Europe. In this role, he is ultimately responsible for all of Fitch's fund and asset management rating activities across these regions, covering all asset classes. Alistair also drives Fitch's asset management research agenda and is a frequent commentator on topical issues, trends, and developments. So we're going to spend the next 40 minutes or so discussing the money market reform and what you need to be thinking about between now and January. We've covered the basics on European money market reform in past webinars and articles, so won't repeat these in too much detail. But as I said, we'll be touching on the post-reform landscape. So Alistair, over to you. Thank you, Michelle, and uh, good afternoon to uh, everyone who attended the, the webinar today. Um, it's a pleasure to be here again, and uh, thank you all very much for, for dialing in. Um, so on your screen, you should be able to see the, uh, the presentation we'll be running through today. Um, these are, um, the slides are interactive. We will have some voting slides, and uh, I would certainly echo uh, Michelle's comment that uh, we, we invite your questions, and indeed we welcome your questions, and we'll um, happily answer those as, as we go along. Um, the agenda we want to cover today, uh, as Michelle said, is first of all to give a brief update on what's coming next in terms of the reforms to then highlight some of the, the key risks, some of the key features of the, uh, the fund types which will be available, to move on to a few remarks on, on the process form landscape, um, and then spend a few minutes on the gift that doesn't stop giving, uh, Brexit. So diving straight in, um, let's talk about uh, an update on, on money market fund uh, reform. Very briefly, um, I wanted to um, uh, highlight uh, the, the key changes that the reform will bring. So under the current uh, framework in Europe, there are essentially three types of, of fund available, uh, a short-term constant net asset value or CNAV fund, a uh, short-term variable or VNAV uh, fund, and also this other category of fund called a standard uh, variable net asset value fund. Those funds are much more common in continental Europe, in France in particular. Now, the key change that the reforms will bring is to uh, uh, remove the current constant net asset value fund type, um, and that will uh, be replaced by a public debt constant net asset value fund, which can only invest in government securities, and the new kid on the block, the low volatility net asset value, or LVMAV fund type. And the LVMAV fund type is going to be very central in our discussions today, and indeed in post-reform landscape. So looking a little bit ahead, um, what is actually going to happen um, over, the, over the coming weeks? Well, uh, reform conversions are already underway. Uh, so the first fund uh, converted to the post-reform formats in September of this year. And uh, in November, just a couple of weeks ago, we saw um, another few funds, uh, fund providers, uh, fund managers, convert their funds. 
And some of these were, were quite major managers of, of money market funds. And one of the key takeaways here is that those conversions were smooth. There were no material operational issues with those funds. We've seen assets have been broadly stable in those funds. So the conversion uh, progressed smoothly. Um, and I think the, the market can take some comfort uh, from that smooth transition, um, which will bode well for, for future conversions. Uh, we are expecting a uh, significant number of fund conversions now in January 2019, and the sweet spot appears to be the weekend of uh, Friday the 11th of January, whereby many funds will close in their current format on, on the Friday and then reopen on the Monday morning, that will be the 14th of January, uh, in their post-reform format. So that is a key date uh, for, for investors to, to look at. And as you can see here uh, in the chart, um, and, and this is just a snapshot of the short-term money market fund varieties, uh, you can see that the low volatility NAV, the LVNAV fund type, um, is, is looking like it will uh, dominate the, uh, the, the assets on the management which are uh, converting. So with that in mind, um, I think perhaps we'll go to our, our first voting question here. Um, so the question here, and this is a question we've, we've run previously in, in webinars, but the question here is, what will be your preferred option post-reform? And here I'd ask you to think about that in terms of your, your key reference currency. And the choices are a standard VNAV, a combination of different money market fund types, the LVNAV, uh, other options, bank deposits, for example, the public debt constant net asset value fund, a uh, short-term variable net asset value fund, or... Uh, we have not decided yet. And for those of you that have not decided yet, uh, you've got about 40 or so days. So uh, my advice to you would be to hurry up and, and make your decision. Um, so if you could all vote now. Okay, uh, last chance to vote. Uh, we're going to go to the answers now. Okay, so uh, we have here that um, the answers show that the majority uh, favour the uh, LVNA uh, fund type at about uh, 36%. Um, Michelle, that looks quite, quite I was going to say that looks so time. similar to last time. Um, so last time it was 40%, so ballpark the same. Uh, and what's interesting as well, I see that the we haven't decided yet uh, comes in at about 18%. Um, so, so some of you clearly still have have some decisions to to make. Um, but interestingly, that looks like it's come down. Yeah, come... which is what we would hope for, as you indeed, <laughs> indeed. As, uh, as as people are starting to make decisions. Um, the VNAV, the percentage VNAV, uh, is is slightly lower than last time. Yes, it is slightly lower than last time, but uh, the combination um, of money market fund types seems to have gone up, uh, gone up slightly here. Um, and also the public time. debt, uh, yeah, constant. Yeah, that's, that's yes, the one you're talking about, is it? That, that has gone up yeah, as, as well. that's interesting. So here, we, 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 what, what, I, what I think we see here is we, we see choices have, have largely been made um, and, and the Alvino fund um, stands out. I wonder if perhaps the combination of different uh, money market fund types uh, touches on the, the, the question of currency a little bit. Uh, and here, in fact, uh, for the audience's benefit, you can see what the results were when we, we ran uh, exactly the same survey in, uh, in, in, in April of this year. Um, so I, I believe uh, audience members will have that for their, their reference um, after the presentation. So, uh, taking a step back, LVNAV continues to be the, um, the, the favourite, uh, the preferred um, option for, uh, for, for the corporate treasurers attending this, this call today. Now, moving on to uh, the, the weighty question of euros. So as all of you on the line will undoubtedly be aware, there has been a, a very active uh, dialogue on uh, euro uh, money market funds. And just to put this all into context, the, the reason this is an issue is that um, yields are clearly negative um, in, in, in Europe, uh, and this has a direct consequence on, on money market funds. Given the constraints on their investment universe uh, and, and restrictions on them, it is virtually, in fact, it, it is physically impossible for a short-term money market fund to generate a uh, positive uh, yield in, in euros, um, unless a fund were to choose to invest in exceptionally low-quality uh, securities, which is uh, very unusual uh, to see. 
As a consequence, uh, money, money fund managers implemented a technique known as the reverse distribution mechanism, or some would refer to that as share cancellation. And this is a mechanism to uh, allow the unit value of the fund to remain stable, so you still get one dollar in, one dollar out, but um, the number of units you own reduces commensurate with the, the yield environment. So it's exactly the same thing as, as having a, a variable share, um, which change the share changes in value. Here you simply have less shares after the year, after the yield um, negative yield is reflected. So it's exactly the same same thing either way. Um, now back in February, ESMA indicated that um, RDM was not um, uh, possible under the reforms. We forward to July, and ESMA um, uh, referred this question to the EC. And then in October of this year. Um, the EC indicated that uh, reverse distrib distribution mechanisms are incompatible with the legal framework established by the Money Market Fund Regulation. So there is uh, clear regulatory um, statements here that this practice is, is not allowable. Ultimately, it will be the national competent authorities, the Central Bank of Ireland, the CSSF in Luxembourg, which are responsible for implementing this. So the exact treatment required um, by uh, the different regulators will clearly be a question for those relevant uh, regulators. But what these statements do appear to suggest, and appear to suggest quite strongly, is that uh, reverse distribution mechanisms uh, will not be possible uh, for Euro uh, money market funds. So let's put another question uh, to you in the audience now. And that question is, what will you do with your Euros? And the options we've given you here are uh, to go to a Euro LV now fund type with a decumulating share class. Now, let me just explain this, this one briefly. So um, if, if reverse distribution mechanisms are not possible, then an LV now with a distributing, that is a stable value share class, would appear to be not possible. However, an LV now with a, a share price which changes in value uh, an accumulating share class is the technical word. I've invented the word decumulating here as in a negative yield environment. That is exactly what this would do. But it would be a variable share price, but within the construct of an LV nav fund. So with the additional investment restrictions that an LV nav has. Do you, do you expect fund managers to be offering that product? I wouldn't rule it out. Okay. Uh, I think there will be technical questions raised, yep. and, and, uh, and certainly that, that dimension to explore, but I certainly wouldn't rule it out. So that's option one, the Euro LV nav with the decumulating share class. Option two is a Euro variable net asset value fund. Um, and uh, the um, uh, informed listeners among you will, will know that a VNAV has a slightly lower uh, minimum liquidity requirements compared with an LV nav. Um, other products, such as bank deposits, um, or option four, uh, lucky you, no Euros, so no problem. So we've had a few minutes to, a few seconds to consider that. Um, so let's see what the results are. Okay, so uh, uh, two things there to highlight. One, um, uh, uh, we, we, we have many investors who don't have euros, so you are you are safe by the bell. We don't have this uh, this to consider. Uh, Euro VNAV don't seem particularly popular, um, and other products such as, as bank deposits um, seem to be uh, the preferred option for those of you that, that do have euros. So that would tend to suggest. Uh, that euro-denominated money market funds uh, may see some outflows as investors uh, favour um, other products. Uh, Alice, so one question that's just come in uh, in relation to this um, is saying uh, euro LV nav funds uh, would need to convert to, to VNAV, and, and I guess potentially this decumulating share class you're talking about. Um, the market is pressing for a grace period of 12 months but nothing's been decided on yet. What is your take on this? Do you think there'll be a grace period um, by the regulators? Well, it's absolutely going to be the question. Uh, so there are there are some funds which have converted to LVNAV, and we are aware of, of some funds with language in their prospectuses which would seem to allow the RDM practice um, to, to happen. So clearly for any, any such fund which has already converted mm. and has that language in the prospectus, which by definition has to have been approved by the relevant regulator. Yes, exactly. Um, then for those funds, the, the key question would be, will there be a grandfathering period? And yeah. so how long will it be? Now, in terms of the length, uh, clearly something that, that investors and yeah. fund managers would, would call for would be as long a period as possible, not least because of, of the rate environment. Mm. I think there is broad consensus that, that rates are improving. 
uh, or improving towards positive territory. And that becomes very significant because as soon as uh, euro short-term yields enter sustainably positive territory, then RDM is no longer an issue. That issue is entirely off the table. And at that point, you could have an LVNAV with a distributing or, or stable value staying share loss. Worth mentioning, just for absolute clarity, we, we, we're talking only about euros here. RDM is not an issue for sterling or US dollar funds in, in any way. Uh, I think it's just an important point of clarity. Because of negative interest rates, yep. Yeah, it's solely driven by uh, the rate environment. So we've um, touched on, on this a little bit already. Uh, so these are the, um, the, the, the possible options under, um, under the um, in, in eventuality that RDM is indeed um, not, not possible. But as we said, the, the grandfathering period will be um, a, a, a question. And just to finish up on this section as well, uh, I just wanted to, to present um, market-based um, projections for, for interest rate movements. And you can see there that the uh, three uh, interest rate futures are, are indeed pointing to um, to rising short-term rates um, over over time, um, over a three-year period there. And also, but I've included the um, Fitch Ratings um, Economics Group's um, outlook uh, or forecast for uh, key uh, key policy rates. And you can see that um, Fitch's Economics Group is forecasting positive eurozone policy rates um, by the end of 2019. So uh, the the potential for stable value LVNAS and euros is is there, uh, but it, uh, based on our economic group's estimates, that is that is still a ways off and is, is not likely to be until at least the end of, of next year, if not slightly after. Okay, uh, so let's move on and um, let's let's dive into some of the uh, the features um, and the risks in, in in the fund types. And here I'm going to um, focus um, on the um, the uh, LVNAV uh, fund type. And there are two things I wanted to touch on. Um, first of all, I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about the uh, uh, net asset value collar, um, and then I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, fees and, and, and gates. So first of all, the the uh, NAV collar. Um, uh, some would call it a corridor, I've called it a collar. Um, so in, in today's uh, constant net asset value funds, there is effectively a collar of 50 basis points. Uh, in post-reform for an LVNA, that will become 20 basis points. Now, if the NAV of the fund, the net asset value, moves outside of this corridor, then at that point, it has to move to a variable pricing structure. Now, if uh, on a subsequent day, the NAV moves back within that 20 basis point collar, then it moves back to a stable price. So this is not permanent. If it breaches that corridor, that collar for a short period of time, it can move back in and move back to stable pricing. So we've taken a uh, look back at uh, history to have a look at how much money market fund NAVs have actually moved. And the short answer is not very much. Uh, so on, on the chart on the left, uh, you can see we've taken a sample of uh, three uh, fund managers in, in, in Europe, and we've taken all of their money market funds um, across a variety of, of currencies. Um, so it's a reasonable number of funds. I would say it, it is a sample, uh, probably better referred to as a case study. So we're, we're building uh, evidence from a, from a case study with this one on the left. But what you can see here is that on the vast majority of observations, the NAV did not move on any individual day. And on an absolute minority of days, uh, there was a movement in the NAV. Uh, and the scale there along the bottom is in basis points. So you can see that the, the maximum movement was uh, two. Uh, I think in one case, maybe it was three basis points. Um, but in any case, the, the maximum movement either up or down was, was a handful of basis points for this sample of, of European funds. So, so Alistair, um, looking at that left-hand chart, you're saying 90, 90 plus percent um, of funds would have a movement of less than 1% in their asset value. Is it? Uh, well, well less than 1%. This is well, yeah. expressed in, in basis points. Okay. Um, so so the, the answer is yes, um, they are they, they show absolutely negligible uh, mm. movements. This is over a five-year period. And, yeah. you know, let's be clear, it's been fairly benign credit commission over that period. So take it with a, uh, with a grain of salt, but the movement has, the observed movement has, has been negligible. And the 20 basis point uh, collar, is that 20 basis point movement in one day or 20 basis point movement in a period of time? It would effectively be in one day, in one day. Uh, because of, of, of the way the funds are priced. Yeah, okay. 
And then um, over a slightly longer period, the chart on the right is uh, my, my colleagues in the U.S. provided uh, data on the um, floating NAV funds in the U.S., which were, were one, of the, one of the products of the U.S. reform process. And they've studied the entire universe in, in well, 45 funds in, in the universe, which is a, a very good sample of the U.S. Uh, prime fund universe. And again, they see a very similar pattern to the, the case that we, we presented for Europe, which is that in the vast majority of cases, there is no movement in the NAV on, on any given day. And where there are movements, those movements are extremely limited. So the historic record here, again, over a fairly benign credit environment period, is negligible movement. So that got us thinking, and uh, got us thinking, well, how could we stress these portfolios, and what kind of stress would a money market fund portfolio need to actually break that, uh, break that collar? And that, we have the answer here on this slide. Now, this is a slightly, slightly complicated slide, um, so, so you, you may want to take some time to, to digest this. The, the, the summary of it, the key takeaway, is that it is highly unlikely that there would be a significant enough instantaneous movement in interest rates to cause an LVNF fund to break the collar. Looking back in history, we can only find one instance, uh, in fact, in the last, uh, I think, 30 years? Yes, 30 years, uh, in which there was an instantaneous interest rate movement significant enough to force a money market fund to break that collar uh, solely from an interest rate movement. And for that, we have done a couple of assumptions. We assumed that the fund had um, a WAM at uh, six, oh, sorry, a WAM, a weight of average maturity of 60 days, which is the maximum that a fund is, is allowed um, under the, the regulation. In actual fact, um, if you refer to the money market fund compare data file that we've uh, that, that is available in the sidebar of your presentation, um, which is a report we publish um, every month showing the key risk metrics for all of the funds that we, we rate. Um, a cursory examination of that file will show you that most of the most of the funds that we rate um, actually have WAMs which are um, well below that that 60 day. Um, and so uh, uh, related, in fact. Elsa, we've actually had two separate questions come in on that. So um, uh, that that chart. So that's one of the questions is uh, on historic findings uh, for movements post global financial crisis. So I think that answers that because November 08 that is post GFC. Um, and it actually answers, I think that chart answers the other question coming in as well. So uh, there is a point of clarification I would, would say on that. We, in, in the previous slide, and I'll just, just flick back to, uh, to that, this is the, the historic observations, that it's five years. Mm -hmm. Now you can go back further, and uh, if you go into the financial crisis, you will find some funds which did have more material movements in, in NAV on a daily basis. But the trouble there is you are not comparing apples with apples. You're you compare apples with oranges. Since the great financial crisis, uh, great, well, probably the wrong word for it, since the financial crisis, um, there have been, at least there have been two rounds of regulation for money market funds. And the fact is that the investment guidelines of money market funds going into the financial crisis were significantly wider uh, than uh, would be permissible under a money market fund post-2013 and certainly post the, the new round of reforms. So the investment latitude that those funds had was markedly different uh, from, from funds today. So quite frankly, we feel that the comparison of those mass movements with, with the fund today is, is, is not an accurate or valid comparison. But it, it is factually accurate to say that there were uh, more material NAV movements in funds at that time. But as I said, not comparable with the um, funds today, given the increased investment restrictions on them. Um, so just going back to this slide briefly, uh, so interest rate movements are not the risk for, for money market funds. Where the risk is, is in credit spreads. So given the 128-day weighted average life limit on a money market fund, uh, um, and again, here we've assumed the fund has that 120-day weighted average life. They don't. Have another look at that Excel file, and you'll see they tend to be considerably lower than that. Um, and we've looked back um, at a variety of indices, um, which are more or less representative, none of them are perfect. Uh, but we've looked at a, a few of these indices, um, and we've identified um, a, a, a fair number of instances where the um, credit spread on the index has moved by a uh, amount significant enough um, to cause a fund to move out of that uh, collar. Um, and there, there are several instances here. There are key determining factors to be aware of, and a lot of this is going to come down to knowing your fund manager. 
So whenever we, we rate a money market fund, a key part of the analysis is a, a review of the fund manager and establishing that their credit processes, their risk management processes, their portfolio management processes are robust um, and that they, they are running their funds um, in, in a robust manner. Um, and the purpose of that is to, uh, as a first line control on, on their ability to identify um, risks prospectively and to adjust their portfolios to avoid uh, those risks. As the evidence we see here is that adverse selections uh, in terms of, of, of lower quality exposures, for example, you see the financials rate of triple B bar there is, is, is a major one, are going to be key factors in the fund um, avoiding um, potential credit issues and hence the reason why assessing the, the fund manager is such a key part of our, of our rating criteria. Someone's asking, what is WAL? WAL, Weighted Average Life. There you so go. A measure of uh, sensitivity to uh, credit spread movements. Weighted Average Life, thank you. So let's move on and have a, a, a few words about uh, dates and fees. Um, so this, uh, this uh, schematic here highlights how the gates and fees work for a low volatility net asset value fund. So the first test is if weekly liquidity, um, as calculated by the reforms, and there are differences between the reforms and the way we fitch uh, liquidity, uh, if weekly liquidity falls below 30% and, and I stress this is an and, so this is a joint probability event, and net redemptions exceed 10%, then the fund is forced to consider, I'll repeat that word, to consider. So this is discretionary, to consider applying a gate or um, a, a fee. And clearly, redemptions and liquidity are going to be closely correlated, but they're not necessarily going to be perfectly correlated. And that means that the joint probability is relevant, and it means that the, the probability of both happening is going to be less than the probability of, of any one happening. Someone's asking here, um, after the collar is breached, uh, the funds will effectively become VNAV, but will they be able to convert that to LVNAV funds after that? Yeah, so that's a great question, um, and, and this is a very technical point. Um, but when uh, an LVNAV breaches the corridor, if it breaches the, the, the collar, then it remains an LVNAV. So it, it's, it, a, it, it, it's not still, temporary, it's permanent. It is still an LVNAV, yep. but it prices in a variable manner. Okay. Um, but then if it moves back into the collar, then it, it is still an uh, LVNAV. It's always been an LVNAV. It will remain an LVNAV, but it moves back to stable pricing. So it's a, it's, sorry, I was wrong then. It's a temporary move. How does it move back to... Well, it doesn't change form. So the, 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 the wrapper, if you like, yep. the, the remains, an LV LV remains an LVNAV. Yep. It moves to, to a variable price yep. at, at a, a number of decimal places. And then if it moves back in, then it moves back. Okay, so once the movement point. is within the 20 basis, point, yeah, 20 basis point collar, that's when it, it can revert. Well, not revert because it hasn't changed, but it just moves. The, the pricing The reverts. pricing the price reverts price. back. Okay. okay. Now, the counter example, and this is where some confusion can arise, is coming back here to gates and fees. Now, if you look at step three on the schematic, if, if a fund suspends redemptions for more than 15 days in any 90-day period, then at that point it ceases being an LVNAV and has to become... And has to become, so that's a bit different. Yep. So that, that's the different condition. Yep. Someone's asking um, if a fund does move out of the 20 basis point collar, are the fund managers responsible to notify the investors of the breach? I would certainly expect they, they would need to notify the, the They would the need to, okay. Yes. And this would, this would be quite so it's, it's the, the other question they're asking, so it isn't really the investor who has to monitor this, it's really the fund manager who should be... Well, we, we would always say it's important for investors to, to monitor the funds that they're invested in and to monitor the, the sure. key risk metrics, and that's one of the reasons we provide the, the, um, the Excel tool that we have with, with the data in it. Um, I can assure you that this will certainly be something we as a rating agency, and we as Fitch, uh, yeah. will be monitoring extremely closely. Okay. And it should be essentially an operational issue. Uh, but that being said, it, it will be new territory because LV now have only been created recently, and whilst this mechanism exists for, um, for, for other types of funds, it's never been tested for an LV now. So this would be a, a, a market event and it would provoke considerable scrutiny, certainly from, from us at Fitch. Uh, just very briefly going back to, to gates and fees, and then I'll come on to some, some data rather quickly. The first step is, is discretionary. So there is a choice there for the, the board of, of directors of the fund to make. Now, if weekly liquidity falls below 10%, then at that point, the board of directors has to do something. But it still has discretion over whether a gate, so that means no redemptions, 
or a fee, which means you, you can still redeem, but you'll take a haircut on, on the assets you redeem. Uh, they still have discretion over what is the, the what, what will serve the investors' interests uh, best. And then the final step is, is a move to a VNAV uh, fund structure if uh, redemption is suspended for 15 days. Someone's asking, how many times can an LVNAV move to variable pricing before the VNAV move is permanent? Is it on that basis? Uh, in, in, so it could move in, in, out, in, in and out? It could move in, in and out um, perpetually. Okay. I think it's highly unlikely yeah, uh, yeah. that, that it would, would, that would happen. Uh, but in, in theory, it could move theory. in and out perpetually. And just when it moves out, it goes to a variable price. When it yeah. moves in, it goes to a stable price. Okay. Thanks. Um, so I'll just um, move on to some, uh, so our, our analysis of the probability of uh, a gate or, or fee uh, being implemented. And our, our assessment is that it, it would be uh, very unlikely. So the, uh, the histogram uh, you can see on, on, on the left uh, is, uh, is, I would say, almost, almost, and this is the, the statistician in me, but it looks like almost a perfect normal distribution, which is always a, a wonderful thing to see, just like the shape of, uh, of snowflakes. That's, uh, a nice Christmas reference. Um, and what you can see here is that the, uh, the uh, historic incidence of uh, outflows of above 10% is negligible. Um, this is, is data over a 10-year period. Um, the eagle-eyed among you may have noticed that we've had a similar slide um, in, in previous presentations and previous research. This is an updated version. The last version was, was over five years. This is over 10 years. So it actually also includes the, the financial crisis. So given that, um, we, are you saying that the 10% the at each end, the extreme ends, uh, would they be the outflows during the last global financial crisis? Interestingly enough, um, no. Um, no, they're, they're not. Um, and actually taking a step back, if you look at the aggregate assets of, of money market funds, um, money market funds saw enormous inflows in, in 2008. Whilst there were some funds which, which clearly had issues and saw, saw outflows, the sector as a whole actually saw very significant inflows, which was investors um, uh, fleeing, turning to cash um, as they, they deallocated from, from risk assets. But here, the, the major inflows and outflows are, are actually a, a, a plethora of, of things. So it, it, it sounds very idiosyncratic. And I would say that this is raw data, this is pure statistical analysis. And what this doesn't account for is the fact that all the fund managers out there have significant distribution and relationship management teams. And their job is to interact with investors and to provide the fund managers with information on when large outflows will happen. Money market funds are built to handle major in and outflows. That is, is one of their purposes. Um, the relationship management side helps um, the funds prepare for, for outflows, which, which can be large but can equally be managed. So again, part of our assessment framework for the manager is how well do you know your investors, how well do you interact with those, and what kind of uh, evidence can you provide us of uh, advanced notification of, of large outflows, for example. And then here on, on the right, um, we have recalculated the liquidity of the weekly liquidity um, using the formula prescribed by the reforms um, for the entire rated portfolio. Uh, Fitch rated portfolio, and we did this in September, so that is you know three to four months ahead of the, the reforms. So none of the funds actually had to comply with the reform limits at that point. So it's an unfair assessment. But what you can see there uh, is that funds are well ahead of that minimum liquidity threshold already. Um, and looking at the funds which have converted to their post-reform formats already, we have seen very very high liquidity um, in those, and we would anticipate that liquidity remaining high. Um, throughout the reform period and, and probably well into 2019. So um, to move on to our, uh, our next section, which is to talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the post-reform landscape. Well, we, uh, we, we expect broad stability, uh, actually. We, we don't think the reforms are going to have that material effect on, on assets under management uh, in, in, in money market funds. The earlier voting slides suggested there may be some attrition in, in the euro segment. But honestly, euros uh, account for a relatively small share of the, the total asset, short-term uh, short euros, I should say, account for a relatively small share of, of the, uh, the assets in, in Europe. Overall assets in, in dollar terms in Europe, about 1.5 trillion. Um, and they've been growing at about about three uh, percent annually over the last uh, last five years or so. And you can see uh, the the share there um, uh, globally um, is dominated by the U.S. and the the share of uh, Europe and Asia is now pretty pretty close. In fact, I'd say the share of Asia would be lar larger were it not for the uh, 
uh, Chinese yuan depreciating against the dollar. The chart is expressed in dollar. So this is a case of how you measure it changing the results. Uh, China has been growing at an annualized rate of about 60% in, in assets under management in, in money market funds. So the, the growth out there in Asia is, uh, is, is truly staggering. Uh, we, have, we have research on that as well available on the website for those of you who are, are interested. Um, putting money market funds into a little bit of, of context in, in Europe, they represent about 8% of the total mutual fund market. Um, and um, interestingly, we, we, we see that um, just outside of money market funds, uh, short term, uh, ultra short term bond funds, I should say, um, have actually been uh, growing um, really quite quickly um, in, in, in Europe. Um, in the EU, uh, yeah. Um, which we, we interpret as um, corporate treasurers uh, revisiting their investment policies in light of the reforms and also responding to the negative yield environment and choosing to allocate some portion of, of their cash to um, ultra-short bond funds and thus preserving most of their cash in, in highly liquid products like money market funds, small amount in ultra-short bond and, and thus achieving a slightly superior uh, blended yield. In terms of the, uh, the, the landscape uh, post-reform, um, so you can see that short-term constant net asset value funds dominated the universe at the end of, uh, end of last year. Post-reform, um, LV NAVs are, are going to dominate. Um, and there we have assumed, and I stress this is an assumption, but we've assumed that all of the uh, Euro, uh, Euro CNAVs convert into short-term VNAVs for the purposes of this chart. The assets under management are indicative only. Uh, this is just to give you a flavor for what the universe would look like. Standard VNAVs, as I mentioned earlier on, um, those are primarily in continental Europe and they have a, a longer risk profile than short-term money market funds. In fact, if you were to take one of those standard VNAV money market funds from Europe and put it in the US, it would fall well outside the SEC's money fund definition and would be classified as a bond fund in the, in the US. And speaking of bond funds, uh, this is just to, to illustrate the earlier point about uh, uh, corporate treasurers allocating to, to bond funds. And you can see here, as, a, as, as an indication of that, the Fitch rated uh, universe of short term bond funds has, has grown uh, quite significantly, both in terms of the number of funds we rate and the, the assets on management, which we interpret as a, a direct consequence of, of the reforms in the yield environment, making corporate treasurers consider uh, some of these as part of a cash segmentation um, strategy. So change, certainly change in terms of, of the products available, but, but also uh, stability uh, overall in, in assets in, in Europe. Moving on to Brexit. The elephant in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I've got a few questions on Brexit. Um, so some of the questions we're getting in um, are for a, a UK corporate um, or even a European uh, corporate, does it matter um, where their money market fund is domiciled? So the, the vast majority of money market funds in Europe are, are domiciled in Ireland, Luxembourg, or France. In France, they tend to be the standard VNA, so I, I won't make any, uh, too many comments on those. For um, an Irish or a Luxembourg money market fund, so this is an onshore EU fund, uh, the Financial Conduct Authority has stated in its uh, preparations for Brexit documents that there will be no restrictions on the sale of UCITs, onshore European UCITs, into the UK for a transition period. I am unclear whether the transition period means the transition period or another transition period, um, but the, the SCA's guidance is very clear that uh, these funds will be allowed to be sold into the UK and will therefore be available to UK onshore UK investors. And the flip side of that, if you're a UK, uh, a European corporate, um, and you want to invest in a, a, a sterling domiciled or UK the domiciled? The is, is less clear. Okay. To the best of my knowledge, the EU has not made a reciprocal um, arrangement. But what I would say is that the, the actual number of money market funds which are domiciled here in the UK is, is, is pretty low, and, and most of those cater to, to purely UK clients. So it's not, not really a major issue. Okay. And, and does your answer change if, if it's a no-deal Brexit? That's something there. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the, the, the FCA's guidance um, w w appears, to be, appears to be clear on this matter. Okay. Now, of course, what Brexit, what Brexit, what form Brexit will ultimately take, anyone's guess. Yeah, is, no. Uh, is good in mind. I think it would be a sensitivity, but the, the guidance the FCA has, has published on this matter, and this is, is all in the public domain, you can find this on the FCA's website and other government documentation, 
would appear to suggest that these funds will continue to be available to, to onshore UK investors. Okay, excellent. Um, I'm aware of the time. I've got um, a question on accounting. Um, so the constant net asset value funds um, typically um, are accounted for as cash and cash equivalent on the balance sheet. Um, if corporates move to a low volatility net asset value fund or a VNAV, a variable net asset value fund, will the accounting treatment uh, stay the same? So I'll answer this in, um, in, in three ways. Um, so first of all, I'll make the, the dreadful uh, faux pas of answering a question with a question, and mm -hmm. say uh, probably a question for, for you on, at the ACT. Um, but I'd, I'd say this would be primarily a question for, for your auditors. Um, from our perspective, uh, as a rating agency, when we, we rate um, a corporate, mm -hmm. uh, the way that we would look at the balance sheet is we would treat money market funds as cash and cash equivalent um, exposures. Uh, in terms of the way that we then calculate downstream uh, metrics that we use in our, our corporate rating uh, methodology. Yes, okay. Um, and I would add to that, you know, that there isn't any uh, specific guidance out there, um, but we would expect them to be cash and cash equivalent, but you do need to speak to your auditors and, and um, that's something you could be doing now, uh, pre-implementation. The, um, the SEC in the US classifies money market funds, including variable NAV market money funds, as cash and cash equivalent, as does the AMF in France. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, another question, um, do you expect money market fund ratings to change post-reform? So we've just published our 2019 outlook for money market fund ratings, and we uh, expect ratings to be stable. Uh, across all regions, uh, so US, China, and, and Europe. Uh, so by definition, that means that we expect the, uh, the trend con conversion of the funds to their post-reform reform formats to not affect ratings, barring a sudden radical change in the risk profile of the fund. Fundamentally, what we rate to is the credit market and liquidity risk profile of a fund, um, and, and that matters more than the name on the tin. Yep. Okay. Uh, I know we're running out of time, but one last question. Um, on the U.S. money market reform, um, you know, when that happened uh, two years ago, there was a mass exodus of uh, of money into other instruments. Do you expect the same with the EU reform? No, no, not at all, not at all. It's really quite different here. Uh, the, the the nature or the construction of gates and fees is different here, and of course, the U.S. did not have the the LV nav fund type, which uh, we see here in Europe is, is clearly a, a preferred option notwithstanding the, the rinky-dink relating to euros. Excellent, excellent. Well, the time has come to wrap up. Um, first, my thanks to Alistair and to Fitch Ratings for sponsoring this webinar. Uh, secondly, thank you to everyone who's uh, joined today's session, and I hope you found the webinar helpful um, and as uh, thought-provoking as I did. Um, as I mentioned at the start, we'll be putting up a recording of this webinar on the ACT website um, in a couple of days, and we'll be sending you all the link in due course. Uh, just uh, some comments or notes on our upcoming events. Um, in February, we have the Deals of the Year Award and also the ACT, ACT Cash Management Conference. Um, in May, we've got our annual conference in Manchester this year, and um, I'm being told that if you want to get the best price, you need to book by the 5th of January. Um, the, quite a few questions came in, so I'm sorry if we didn't get around to your questions, uh, but we did get through quite a few of them. Um, but I'm certain that uh, this is not going to be the last you'll hear on this topic. Um, finally, if you can spare a moment uh, to provide some feedback on the webinar, we would be very grateful. Just select the feedback widget, that's the green one at the bottom of the screen, and this facility will be, remain open uh, for a short while after the webinar ends for you to do so. So from all of us here, thank you and goodbye. <laughs>